how much, how long do you want your trial and error stage of being a gardener to be? How much error do you want? How much error can you endure before your, your energy, your self-confidence, your, your essence becomes drained? You're listening to the Maritime Gardening Podcast, episode 98, brought to you by Vessi Seeds. Well, folks, today I'm doing a different kind of episode. I'm actually filming it outside. Why, you may ask? Well, because I don't have the sound equipment I need to uh, <laughs> to record this indoors in my office. Uh, I had a issue with my sound equipment, and um, uh, I've ordered new stuff in, but it's COVID-19, and just nothing is uh, happening the way it's uh, not ordinarily should. And that's you know whatever. We'll, we'll work around it. So I thought um, I would do an episode uh, using my, what they call shotgun mic, uh, outside. And um, hopefully uh, there, you know, there's a bit of an ambiance here and some birds singing in the background and so on and so forth. So hopefully that creates another ambiance. If you like this, I can do more episodes like this. If you like, if you prefer the studio uh, sound, which, which I never do well anyway, <laughs> we, we can continue with that. Um, so anyway, today's episode of the... Uh, Maritime Gardening Podcast is, the theme is advice for the new gardener and on the importance of learning as much as you can before you start to build your garden or if it's your first year. The idea is that, the simplest way I can put this is when you go about beginning to have a garden. You, you want to grow food on your land. You've, you've got a house, you've got property, you've got access to property, whatever the situation is, and you want to grow some food, and you want to grow as much as you can, and you want to be good at it. When you take that up, there's going to be a learning curve. And the question you need, to, you know, it's, it's not all going to work out perfectly year one. I mean, I guess it could, but it's, you know, <laughs> It could go that way, but it might not go that way, right? <laughs> it is usually some trial and error and a bit of a learning curve, right? So the question you need to ask yourself is, you know, how long do I want to be doing the whole learning curve thing? And, of course, I can tell you from experience, the learning curve is going to last the rest of your life, okay? But, you know, it can go like this, or it can go... This, you know, so that the learning curve can be just very gradual and slow as you trial and error, trial and error your way to being a reasonably good gardener, or you're having, you can have a learning curve like this, right? It goes up very steeply and then peters off. And you still continue to learn because you can always learn new things, right? So that's the bit. The fundamental question is, how much, how long do you want your trial and error? stage of being a gardener to be? How much error do you want? How much error can you endure before your your energy, your self-confidence, your your essence becomes drained? Right? Error, and there's nothing more draining than essence. Than essence. There's nothing more draining than error. You know, if you fail at something and fail at something and fail at something, I think it's very natural to say, ah, the heck with that, right? I can't do that thing. Uh, I think it's totally natural to give up uh, and say, well, maybe I should just be doing something else. <laughs> um, so the way to avoid all of that, and this is the best, some of the best, I mean, I've been doing a number of videos very recently where I'm trying to, because I know there's a lot of people, I, I, I can tell my subscriptions are up to my YouTube channel. The comments are going up. Lots and lots of people are tuning into my channel and other channels. Because there's lots of people right now that for the first time in their life, they got a couple minutes to catch their breath. They're concerned about food security, etc., etc., and they're putting in a garden, a food garden, on their yard. Or maybe they've been doing that for a number of years, but more of in a hobby type way, a flirtatious type way. They're playing at gardening. They're playing at growing food. And now things have gotten a little bit serious, right? And so they're trying to get a bit more serious about it. Okay, I'm going to really grow some food now. I want to grow as much food as I possibly can on my piece of land. By the way, that's what I've been trying to do since I bought a house. 
right? How much food can I grow on the land that I own and pay property taxes on and all that stuff while spending as little money as possible and doing it and expending as, least, as little as, of my energy as I can in trying to do that. So, the best I can, advice I can give a gardener, other than the videos I've just done recently about, you know, you got to understand, that, you know, location really matters, how much sun is the piece of land getting, you know, is uh, how you design your garden can have a great effect on the, its productivity and your success. And of course, uh, the quality of your soil and doing things to improve your soil, all that stuff matters. It matters a lot. But I can't stress enough the importance of just studying and learning, right? Um, I do not understand why this is not step one for most gardeners. And I can even, <laughs> if you think I'm criticizing other people, I'm also criticizing myself. First time I bought a house, I said, hey, I'm going to have a garden. My parents had a garden, I'm going to have a garden. And I made some rectangular spaces and made, you know, it was like grass, so it was green. I made the green space brown and I stuck seeds in the ground and now I'm here, <laughs> right? <laughs> so I understand, oh, okay, I've got all this energy, I've got all this inclination, I want to get out there, I want to plant stuff and things are going to grow and I'm going to water it and there's going to be sun and I'm going to have food and we're going to enjoy it and we're, we're going to be healthy. I understand that inclination. But what you're going to find, you know, after that passes, you know, that first year, maybe things will work out great for you, that's possible, right? But there's probably going to be something go wrong in that first year. And you're, you're going to be confused. Why didn't that thing grow? Is my soil no good? Do I, am I not naturally good at this? Um, is there some thing I need to be doing to make that thing work? And that's when you're going to start to do a little bit of reading or watching YouTube videos or, or what have you, right? I mean, when I say, I'm going to use the word reading a lot in this, <laughs> in this podcast, but when I say reading, I just mean studying, right? You don't have to read. You could be looking at a YouTube video. There's all kinds of different options you have out there. Um, I will have to say that, you know, there's a thing about YouTube is that you are constantly pressured to make everything short, right? If I make, if I have lots of videos that are eight minutes long, five minutes long, 10 minutes long. I got like 380 videos at this point in time. End of April, 2020. And some of them are 10 minutes long. Some of them are 20 minutes long. Some of them are an hour long. And I'm always getting uh, pressure uh, on two different levels. I'll, have, I'll do a short video and there'll be all kinds of questions. What about this? What about that? What about this? What about the other thing? And I have to answer all those questions. Or I have a really long video and people are saying, ah, oh, that video was too long. You talk too much. <laughs> right? So either I'm talking too much and answering almost every conceivable question, every question I can think of. Um, which is my inclination, right? My background as a teacher is to, while you're explaining something, try to, I mean, the good teacher is the person that has empathy for the student and tries to anticipate the student's question and answer the question in the course of explaining the thing being taught. Um, but the, the video format, especially YouTube video format, doesn't necessarily reward that in the sense that people want it to be, okay, 10 minutes, I want 10 minutes to tell me everything I need to know about having an awesome garden in my backyard. Well, I can't do that. I can't tell you in 10 minutes everything you need to know. It's just not like that. I guess where I'm going with all of this is I, I think there's a general, uh, among, the, <laughs> among the public, the new gardener, uh, a lack of appreciation for the wealth of knowledge that goes into being competent at growing food in a given ecosystem, whatever that ecosystem is. I think we tend to make the mistake um, of, of looking at gardening as a, um, I, I could be wrong here, but we tend to make the mistake of, of looking at gardening as a, a peasant's activity, right? It's something that traditional people have done all around the world for thousands of years, illiterate people, right? 
um, uncivilized people, all these certain terms, right, that we charge up. Uh, and so we're sophisticated, we're modern, so we can just, you know, do it. Right? There is a, a, a pretty, there's a lot of little pieces to that puzzle of achieving a really good productive garden where you are, right? I mean, there, there's some basics, nitrogen, NPK, you know, all that sort of stuff, right? There's some basics about the things the plants need and sunlight, you know, six hours, ideally eight hours a day of sunlight. There's some basics like that, right? But there are many nuances, depending on what you're trying to grow, what kind of plant, where you are, what, what challenges you're working with, that generations of people have worked at solving and are still being solved on an ongoing basis using a range of, of techniques, like my technique, of, um, which I did not, it did not invent. <laughs> the no-till gardening approach, right? The, the deep mulch approach. So there's a mistake people make in thinking that, okay, I'm going to have a garden, I'm going to stick some seeds in the ground, everything's going to grow. That is akin to making the mistake that, well, you know, it's a peasant thing, so I can do it because I'm sophisticated. And I think that's analogous to the kind of mistake that, I mean, I'm, I'm going to use a very Canadian example here, but, you know, when the land was being, you know, uh, explored, I guess, by, <laughs> it's a nice way of putting it, by Europeans, and they would engage with the uh, indigenous population here, in Nova Scotia that would be the Mi'kmaq, um, the indigenous people here, the, the First Nations people, um, there was an inclination among the explorers, the Europeans, to say, oh, these people, you know, they're, they're, they're primitive, they're savages, that, 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 right? They're not sophisticated like us. Um, and they would think that way unless they were going into the woods for any length of time. And then they would absolutely take a number of these people with them. And why did they do that? Why did they bring the, the indigenous people, the First Nations people with them as guides when they went in the woods? Because they were helpless in that environment. They didn't understand it. They had some idea, right? But really, uh, what they were hiring these First Nations people to do was to help them with their unbelievably sophisticated, high level, you know, the rich, deep understanding of the, of the environment, of the things that were in it, of the season, of the, you know, position of the sun relative to a certain time of year, whatever game they were looking for, that game's tendencies. These people had an incredibly sophisticated understanding of the natural world in the ecosystem where they've been living for generations. And it was superior to that of any European at the time, right? Not only that, but like how to make that birch bark canoe. You know, you got a knife, you got an axe, some really basic tools, and you can make a bloody canoe out of some trees. I mean, that's amazing, uh, an amazing uh, art form, uh, a craft, an amazing technology, right? So in the same way that those people really did, un did not appreciate the full sophistication of the knowledge base of those um, tr uh, traditional knowledge of the indigenous people, right? I think people tend to make the same mistake with gardening, where they think it's just a, a pretty simple thing. You've got the, the soil is this uh, sponge, and you put certain chemicals in the sponge, and you put a seed in the sponge, and the seed makes a plant, eat the plant. And uh, I mean, th that's one way of looking at it. And, uh, I suppose, in a sense, you, know, you can be successful if you look at it that way. Um, but I think there is a value in understanding how to interact with an ecosystem. As a, you're a human being, and you're trying, you got some seeds, or whatever, you know, th things that you're trying to grow in a given ecosystem. There is a value, as a human being who's trying to grow things to eat in an ecosystem, to developing the richness of understanding that you have for that ecosystem so that you can have a nuanced understanding of that system. Right? You can make little adjustments. You know that this year spring seems to be a bit late. You know that uh, last year it was early and so on and so forth. Um, and I can give some really simple examples. So I've noticed just this last week um, 
There's a thing that happens every spring in Nova Scotia. There's these little um, frogs that mate in the spring. And uh, they only do it when the temperature is right. And they do it every year. And they've been doing it since amphibians <laughs> started, which is way before us. So this is a species of plant that's been around a lot longer than us. Not species of plant. This is a species of, uh, you know, there's a living thing, an amphibian. It's been around a lot longer than human beings, I would guess. And they, <laughs> there's some weird noise over there, probably a pheasant. Um, and they seem to know when it's time to come, come out of whatever they're hibernating in and mate. And if they do it too soon, they'll freeze to death and die. Or, you know, wherever they've laid their eggs will fail. So they seem to know when it's the right time to do it. And sure, they're, they're operating on instinct and this sort of thing. But that is a great indication of true spring. You know, the point in time of the year when it's warm enough and the soil is warm enough. And the, the, the soil where you are has had enough sun and enough heat and enough springtime... Um, Springtime activity, right? Length of day, sun, snow is melted, warming of soil, everything becoming activated, right? That sort of springtime activity. When those spring peepers do their nighttime song, it'll probably start in about two hours here, that, that song. For me, that seems to be the same time where I start seeing my rhubarb poke out of the ground. My perennial lovage, which is like a celery-like plant, starts poking up out of the ground. Uh, some buds on some trees start to swell. Um, some perennial weeds, like uh, dandelion and things like that, uh, uh, plant plantain, those things start to, the greens start to be uh, observable on the ground. I also notice another thing. Um, you know, my house backs onto a forest. And there's wild animals in the forest. And right around the same time that the uh, spring peepers start to sing their mating song, that is almost always the same time that I start to see porcupines on my lawn looking for food. They're not eating my grass, right? Because if they were eating my grass, I'd have thousands of them all the time, right? They're eating certain weeds that taste good to them that are young. Maybe even taste good to them only when they're young. But there's a lot of plants that when they're small, they're, they're not um, bitter. And then once they get to a certain size, they become, the larger they become, the more bitter they become. There's a good a number of plants have that quality, where when they're young, they're not bitter, and then they're, they become more bitter as they get larger. And there's lots of possible explanations for that that would, I could probably blow a whole video on that. Um, so that's when, when I see porcupines on my lawn looking for what they're looking for. I think they're looking for baby dandelions, to tell you the truth, and maybe baby plantain, right? Because those are things people eat, and those are starting to grow around the same time the spring peepers sing. So, and the reason the spring peepers are important to me is because there's this fish I like to catch called a smelt that uh, when the spring peepers sing, the smelts go up the river. So it's all timed, right? So when I see a, it's obvious to me, porcupines are quite large, sort of, you know, large animal, reasonably large anyway. And they have no fear, really, because they've got all this armor on them. So uh, sometime in early April, I sort of, every evening, uh, I look out on my property and I see if there's any porcupines on the lawn. Um, and I noticed this year that the porcupines started grazing on my lawn almost exactly the same time as the spring peeper started singing. So now I know there's there's more than one indication, right? So when I see the porcupines, when the spring peepers are singing, also when that's happening, all my garlics, all my garlic is up by that time of the year. My perennials are all, you know, not all of them I guess, but um, my rhubarb and my lovage, two perennials I have in my garden, they're up. The Egyptian walking onions I planted last year, they're up. Right? So I know that things that are tough and that are hardy can grow that time of year. And I also know that you know there are certain kinds of seeds that I can plant this time of year. 
people tend to have this concept that you should not plant anything until the first new moon in June or what we call in Canada May 2-4 weekend which is you know a, a, a nominal celebration of uh, I think Queen Victoria's birthday who doesn't even live in it not even alive anymore um, because Canada is you know connected to we're part of the Commonwealth to some extent um, so People tend to look at that weekend, which usually happens around May 24th, May 2-4, and people tend to drink beer, 2-4. Um, for those that aren't from Canada, a 2-4 is a, 20, a case of 24 beers. <laughs> so, <laughs> uh, May 2-4 weekend is, is, you know, maybe a week before the first new moon in June. Anyway, these are, these are dates people tend to uh, hold as uh, important for when to plant in my part of the world. And uh, there's a whole bunch of things you can plant before that because the seed, and any seed you can basically throw on the ground in the fall that just grows anyway in the spring can be planted anytime. Any seed that you get in a package where it says plant as soon as the soil can be worked, right? That's a seed you can plant as soon as the soil can be worked. It means that seed can handle being frozen and thawed and frozen and thawed. And the plant that grows out of that seed is relatively frost resistant. It can handle a frosty night, right? It can't handle minus, minus 15 or something like that, but maybe it can handle minus nine Celsius or something like that. All right, so these are all things you, you learn um, over time. I'm, I'm giving in an example as, you know, I just learned this year that the porcupines start grazing on my lawn when the spring, peep, uh, spring peepers start singing, right? I grew up smelt fishing and I, I've always seen the spring peepers as a, a sign of spring. And in fact, I believe the, the Mi'kmaq calendar sort of places, I don't have any background in that, I'm not I'm just whatever, some kind of European descendant guy, <laughs> whatever I am, I don't know what I am, but uh, <laughs> but we, uh, my family, we would always go um, you know, catching smelts uh, in the spring. And we would do it when we heard the spring peepers. That was the sign, right? Um, and so I've always associated that with spring. Um, but I just noticed just this year that when that happens, that's also when I see porcupines around, right? The porcupine, the whole winter long, it, it doesn't hibernate. It eats bark off of trees, like spruce trees and pine trees and stuff like that, and sometimes birch trees. It eats bark all winter long. It doesn't gain any weight. It eats bark so it doesn't starve to death. It just sort of hangs on all winter long. It ekes out a meager existence. And then at some point in the spring, that's, you know, the females are having babies and then the males are, you know, fighting each other, <laughs> whatever the porcupines do, right? But they need better food, right? Uh, bark is not something they eat all summer long. Bark is something they eat in the winter to keep, because that's all there is, right? So they eat that to keep from starving to death. But in the spring, when these new shoots start coming under the ground, that's when the porcupine gets extraordinarily active and eats as much as it can, and it's a nocturnal animal, so it's just eating and sleeping all day around. All, all the time, it's eating and sleeping. So, I have noticed, because unlike a lot of other living things, they don't have this natural fear of being out in an open space. So they, they show up on my lawn and start eating stuff. So, the only reason I bring that up as an example is that you're, you're always learning. You're always learning more. So the best advice I can give the new gardener is try to minimize the the length of time that you, your experience as a gardener is dominated by that trial and error aspect of gardening. One problem with gardening is that if you make a mistake, you gotta wait a year to try again. Right? It's not like, um, I'll use a hockey example, you lose this game, you make an adjustment, you win the next game. With gardening, the next game is next year. <laughs> right? A lot of these things we're trying to grow, they take like 100 days, 90 days, something like that. Some things, some things less, some things more. But really, there's like a sweet spot for anything we're trying to grow, um, unless you're living in one of those ideal climates where it's just warm and sunny all the time. But uh, if you're a northern gardener like I am, You've got a, you know, a, a, you've got a gardening season, and you got one shot, and uh, it either works or it doesn't. And if it doesn't work, you, you spend the better part of your winter trying to figure out what went wrong and 
coming up with some plan for what to try next time. So, if there's one thing you come away from this, this podcast remembering, it's that you've got a choice if you're a new gardener. You, you can spend a year learning about gardening or in an hour you can do some reading or watch a YouTube video or whatever. And in that hour you can learn from someone with experience a year's worth. Right? There's a value in that. Right? You could spend uh, you know, a number of hours or a number of evenings or, or whatever reading, watching YouTube videos, watching other resources, learning about gardening, and you can save yourself an incredible amount of trial and error by just absorbing all that information. Now, I understand that people have this inclination, and I'm like this, so I get it. That I don't want people telling me what to do. I want to do my own thing. I want to make up my own thing. I want to just be. I want to. I want to use my creativity, and I just want to get out there and and and, and work through it, and work through the problems, and I just want to learn organically, and just leave me alone, and you know, let me just work it out myself. I get that. I'm I'm wired like that. Okay. <laughs> but you know, I think all of that can. Ha- Once you have a, f- I think it. I think you waste a lot less time. If you build up a foundation of knowledge really quick by reading and watching YouTube videos, watching, you know, documentaries, whatever. What am I trying to say? You can save a lot of time. Remember, failure takes a year to try again, right? So you can save a lot of time. You can, you can get through that trial and error process with, with a, 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 a somewhat less unscathed, I guess. If you, at the front end of your, of your journey as a gardener, just just binge on the information. Not all, of it, not all of it's going to be relevant. A lot of it's going to sound like noise to you. And as you become experienced, some of that information you got earlier might become more relevant. But you can really cut down on the, the length of time. Okay, let's say you want to be here. You know, someone that you're planting all the things you want to eat, and they're all growing, and every year you get something out of it. Right? And, and but you're here. <laughs> right? <laughs> You're lower, right? You're not there yet. You you got a ways to go. Well, how quickly do you want to get up there, right? Do you want that journey to be a very slow, very slow, gradual journey, or you know, do you want that journey to be, you know, a very steep, fast journey? Right? You can change that dramatically by just devouring information on gardening. Not just me. I'm not doing this to make to get you to watch all my stuff, right? There's lots of other um, good resources out there, and I, I can't stress enough the value of, of books. You, you just cannot, you know, in a, in a catchy 10, 15 minute YouTube video, even in a one hour, however long this podcast is, right? Even in that amount of time, you, you can't convey the information that it takes generations to learn in 30 minutes, 45 minutes, or whatever. You just can't. But in a book, you can right? Get a really good book on gardening. The, the one, I just did a podcast recently, I'll put the name of it up, but it's, it's a book on soil. If there's anything more important to gardening and soil, I don't know what it is. Um, so uh, I think it's called Improving Your Soil, Keith Reed. Um, it's a great book if you want to understand. I'm not, not doing this video to plug Keith's book. I haven't talked to Keith. <laughs> we did a podcast last time. Um, but it is a really good resource for understanding soil. Um, I think the, the back of the book actually has a better title than the front of the book. It says, Bar- Better Soil Equals Better Gardens. I couldn't, ag- I couldn't agree more. Um, what's required of you from the learning curve point of equation is it's so much less that's required of you to just read. I know it looks... Uh, I know people just, even t- especially today, people don't like to read anymore. Um, but think of what goes into putting in a garden, planting everything, tending it, watering it, weeding, da, da, da. Think of all that, everything that goes into having a garden. That's a lot of time and energy, as opposed to reading a book, right? Um, you, you can read a book in a few evenings if you're, you know, an avid reader. Or if you're like me and, you know, you have a hard time sort of sitting still, I, I tend to just keep, keep a book. I have a stack of books next to the toilet. <laughs> 
So if I'm on the toilet, I just pick up one of the books and start reading it. I usually have a pencil there, I make little notes, that sort of thing, and just gradually the information percolates into my head, right? Um, there is such an advantage to, to engaging in literature about the topic you're interested in. Uh, people are, are often asking me questions about things that, I mean, don't, I, I'm, I'm not your guru, right? Uh, learn to inquire for yourself. I mean, sure, sure I, I love answering questions, and, and, and as long as my channel doesn't become an, an completely enormous, I'll answer as many questions as I can. Um, but I think it, there's a value in just becoming curious and inquisitive, inquisitive uh, as a gardener and, and learning to answer your questions, learning the good resources for that. And for me, I find those to be, uh, aside from the odd good book, um, the agricultural extensions that you can find. Uh, online that are published, produced, provided by universities. There is a degree of quality control in the information that's being shared there. Some whack job just can't put something up on an agricultural extension website because it's university has got their reputation behind it to some extent, right? So um, that's the, the resource. So if someone asks me a question about something, People have been asking me recently, that one of my most watched videos is a video I did on Hugo culture gardens. And people are always asking me, does that cause termites? What happens with turnips? How do you deal with termites? Termites, termites. I don't have termites here. I don't know anything about termites. I don't, it's not a problem I've ever had to deal with. So I, 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 I'm not going to answer a question on termites because I can't speak from experience. I only answer questions. If I answer the question, I'm speaking from experience. Otherwise, I'll direct you to some literature. Um, but even then, I'm, I'm reluctant to direct you to literature if it's not speaking to something I'm, I've got some experience with. So for something like termites, I would, I would type in extension, hugo culture, termites. <laughs> and maybe you'll find uh, some university agricultural extension, maybe in the southern United States, because they've got termites there, um, speaking to how, you know, whether it's an issue in a garden, what it means for a garden, or what risk that's putting your home at, and that sort of stuff. Um, so it is worth your while to just voraciously fill your mind. <laughs> right? That's the best advice I can give someone who's, who's getting into gardening, aside from the basics about soil and sun and water and you know that sort of design and that sort of stuff. That All that stuff matters, but the the, the the other dimension, <laughs> right, is just the skill, the knowledge base, the problem solving, all that sort of stuff. And you develop that over time, of course, right? But you can speed up that process by just studying as much as you can. If you're into permaculture, you can, you can find, if you just do a Google search for permaculture too. I don't know if, it, I don't know how this thing got provided, but um, I do a lot of permaculture in my garden, and there's a lot of gurus online trying to sell you their crap, trying to get you to take their stupid courses, trying to get you to buy into their guru, whatever. <laughs> you can tell what I think of that. Um, in my opinion is, why don't you read the book written by the guy that uh, people tend to view as the guy that knows about that thing, right? So if you just Google permaculture too, you can find a book on permaculture written by Bill Mollison. Just, just, just Google permaculture 2, T-W-O, I think T-W-O, Bill Mollison. Just, I'm not going to put a link to it here because I don't know if, if the link is uh, legal or not. But if you do a search for that, that search term, permaculture 2, Bill Mollison. Maybe even type in the word or the term PDF. You can download a PTF. PTF. You can download a PDF of Bill Mollison's book, Permaculture 2, which is a book he wrote for the home gardener about permaculture. You don't need to take a course. You don't need to pay some charlatan <laughs> hundreds of dollars to feed their ego, right? You don't need to listen to me. Just pick up that book and read it and work your art, right? So I brought up the topic a little bit earlier about wanting to try your own thing and play around and work your way through it and problem solve and evolve 
And that's a creative process and it's extremely human uh, inclination. All of that can happen after you've spent years or, or, or hours or whatever, right? <laughs> you can study a lot and still work. You know, still do the creative thing, right? I mean, when I think back to the, the resources that I studied to learn about no-till gardening, permaculture gardening, rootstock gardening, back to Eden gardening, right? I, I, have, I devoured all the information that I could find for free <laughs> that was provided by those, those gurus. If you, know what I'm if, if you know those terms, you know who I'm talking about, right? I devoured everything I could find. And then I tried to put it, my garden's over here, I tried to put it into practice in my garden. And guess what? I made little changes. I made little uh, footnotes on their approach. Well, what if I went with this? What about that? You know, maybe wood chips aren't, you know, because if you watch Back to Eden, wood chips, wood chips, wood chips, wood chips. You don't really need wood chips to have a back to Eden garden. You don't really need straw to have a, or, or hay to have a roost out garden. You, you know, you, you, there's a term about being on the shoulders of giants, right? It doesn't matter how much you've studied. That does not lock you into being a disciple of the person you studied. You, you study and you study and study, and then you, you start developing your own thing. You can still grow. You can still innovate. You can still be creative. You can still play in your garden. It doesn't matter, you know, that you've read the work of all these other people. You're not constrained to doing the things they said you have to do. And a lot of these people, especially I think Ruth Stout, she's like, do what you want to do. She talks like that, right? Um, she can't stand being constrained. Um, so, you, you know, the fact that you've done all this reading and all this research, it doesn't mean you're not going to get to be creative. You're not going to get to try your own thing. You can still play around. You can still figure out. I do it every single year in my garden. I try to share as much of that as I can with you. So, a um, bit of a rambling video, kind of all over the place, but uh, I had a general point I was trying to make, and I think I made it. <laughs> it is worthwhile if you're a new gardener to study and uh, devour and, you know, sure, get out there and play and stick some seeds in the soil and see what happens. But uh, as much as you can, try to get the information in the head. <laughs> and I think you'll find over time that as you run into problems, that information base will help you come up with good ideas for dealing with those problems and overcoming them and, and getting that garden you want and having the success you want. So I hope you found this uh, podcast interesting. I hope the, the sound and the ambience was uh, okay. Uh, if you like this, please like, share, subscribe. If you're listening to this uh, as an audio recording, um, you know, um, if you enjoy this uh, content uh, and you want to help support my channel, I have a sponsor, uh, Vessi Seeds. They make the, um, you know, they provide the resources I need to, to fund the equipment, the gear, the website hosting, and all that sort of stuff. If you want to help support this channel, this content, uh, and there's something you need that they sell, go to their website, vessies.com, and, and buy it from them. And that, using my coupon code, GAVS20, and that will help support the channel. So, hope you found this interesting. If you did, please like, share, subscribe. Until next time, get out there, get at it, have fun in your garden. Thanks for watching. <laughs>